Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about um, the saltwater aspects of the hydrologic area, and that is the oceans. Um, I'm going to cover wave motion as well as zones in the ocean. The Earth is called the blue planet because nearly 72% of the surface is covered by water. The Earth's ocean can be divided into four main basins, the Pacific, Atlantic, Arctic, and Indian basins. And you can see them starred here. The Pacific Ocean is the largest of the four ocean basins. It covers half of all of the world's ocean surface. It is the deepest ocean um, at 3,940 meters deep, and that is located at the Mariana Trench. The Atlantic Ocean Basin is half the size of the Pacific Ocean. It is considered a relatively narrow ocean. However, it is expanding. The Indian Ocean is smaller than the Atlantic Ocean and is located mostly in the Southern Hemisphere. The Arctic is roughly 7% of the size of the Pacific Ocean Basin and it is the shallowest of the four oceans. The seafloor is very similar to the features found on its continents. However, we can't see them directly. We have to use instruments to see the floor, and those instruments are commonly sonar, satellites, or submersibles. Sonar is an acronym for Sound, Navigation, and Ranging. Sonars, uh, sonar was developed in the early 1920s to map the seafloor for the Germans during World War I. The British and the Americans also mapped the seafloor. Sonar works by transmitting sound waves toward the ocean bottom. The sound wave is transmitted and the echo of the wave is then picked up by a receiver. Satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit are able to measure small differences by bouncing microwaves off the ocean surface. Using this new technology, scientists have discovered that the ocean surface is not perfectly flat. Differences in the height of the ocean surface are caused by ocean floor features. Submersibles are small underwater craft used for deep ocean research. They were first used in 1934 by William Beebe, who descended to 923 meters. In 1960, Jacques Picard descended in an untethered submersible, the Trieste, which is pictured here, to 10,912 meters in the Mariana Trench, or 36,373 feet. The Mariana Trench also measures at 6,062 fathoms um, and about seven miles. The pressure down there was 2,221,360 pounds per, of water per foot, or uh, 1,136 tons of water uh, per foot. So, quite heavy. The ocean floors have been divided into three major re regions, the continental margins, the ocean basin, and the mid-ocean ridge. The continental margin is the transition zone between the continent and the ocean basin. Ocean basins are located at the bottom of the continental rises or continental slopes, and the mid-ocean ridge is found near the center of most ocean basins and are associated with divergent plate boundaries. That's why I said that the Atlantic was growing. Continental shelf gently slopes away from the continent. It is almost non-existent along active margins. So in other words, if it's a tectonically active area, you're generally not going to have very much of a shelf. Along passive margins, though, the shelf can extend as far as 1,500 kilometers from the seashore, and slopes um, generally are very mild. They're about two meters for every kilometer out. The economic importance of continental shelves is that there are mineral deposits, large reservoirs of oil and natural gas, sand and gravel, and also they serve as fishing grounds. You can see here the seaward edge of the continental shelf. The boundary between the continental crust and the oceanic crust is considered the continental slope. Slopes are steeper than the continental shelf. They're fi between 5 and 25 plus degrees. So you can see they go down quite 
quite sharply. The basin includes the abyssal plains, trenches, and volcanic features such as seamounts and guyouts. They include approximately 30% of the Earth's surface. The deep ocean trenches are long, narrow canyons that uh, form at convergent plate boundaries. They form the deepest parts of the ocean. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench has been measured at 11,022 meters deep. The abyssal plains are extremely flat and deep. They have a thick accumulation of fine sediments and are too far out in the ocean for sand, so it's not considered sand. The Atlantic Ocean has the thickest accumulation of sediments because it has no trenches to catch and carry the sediments away. Seamounts once um, are submerged volcanic peaks that dot the ocean floor. They're volcanoes that have never reached the surface of the ocean. Um, they tend to be steep-sided, one-cone peaks. And finally, guyouts are um, formed once an underwater volcano reaches the surface and the plate moves the volcanoes away from the hot spot. The volcanoes die and begin to erode. Once the volcanoes erode to the surface of the ocean, they become atolls or guyouts. Guyouts are considered once active, now submerged, flat-topped volcanoes. The mid-ocean ridges are found near the center of most ocean basins and are associated with the divergent plate boundaries. These are the single largest topographic features on Earth. They can exceed 70,000 kilometers in length and they can be between 1,000 and 4,000 meters wide. Ocean sediments are classified according to their origin into four categories terrigenous sediments, biogenous sediments, hydrogenous sediments, and cosmogenous sediments. Terrigenous means terra means earth, genus means to produce. So these are sediments that originated from the continent itself. Biogenous, remember bio means life, so these are the second most abundant marine sediments. Sediments that have a biological origin, and they consist of shells and skeletons of marine animals and algae. There are two types, calcareous ooze, made from calcium carbonate shells, and silicaceous ooze, made from the shells that contain silica, which would be like radiolarians and diatoms in the algae group. Hydrogenous sediments are sediments that consist of minerals that crystallize or precipitate directly out of ocean water through chemical reactions. These can include manganese nodules, which are found in deep sea beds near the hydrothermal vents, uh, evaporates, which are salts, calcium carbonates, or limestone, and they usually accumulate very slowly. Finally, the fourth category is the cosmogenous sediments. Remember, cosmo means universe. These are the least abundant of all the sediments, and they have no distinct layer. Most dissolve in the seawater before they reach the sea floor, but they are of extraterrestrial origin and come from crashed asteroids, comets, and meteors. Seawater consists of 96.5% water and 3.5% dissolved minerals. The dissolved minerals typically are called salts. Salinas means salt, so the salinity is the total amount of solid material dissolved in water. It's the ratio of the mass of dissolved substances to the mass of water in a sample. Ratios are usually expressed in parts per hundred. However, since the amount of dissolved solids is so small, oceanographers express salinity in parts per thousand. Most of the salt in seawater is sodium chloride, or table salt. Sea salt can come from two basic sources, either from chemical weathering of the continental rocks or from Earth's interior. Chlorine, bromine, sulfur, and boron are all emitted as gases from fissures or vents in the ocean floor, so they are strictly from the Earth's interior. Ocean surface water temperatures varies with the amount of solar radiation, so therefore it varies with the degree of latitude. Low latitudes equate to warmer water, and higher latitudes equate to colder waters because you're getting toward the poles. Ocean water temperatures can also vary with depth. The warm waters near the equator gradually cool with depth to about 300 meters. Between 300 and 1,000 meters in depth, the water cools to near freezing. 
This area is a boundary called the thermocline. Thermo means heat, cline means slope. The thermocline is a vertical barrier to many forms of life, and it also disrupts sonar transmissions. Generally, the ocean is layered into three zones, the shallow surf mi surface mixed zone, the transition zone, and the deep zone. In the shallow surface mixed zone, the water temperatures are the warmest on the surface. It's a high energy zone because waves, currents, and tides typically happen here. They extend 300 to 450 meters in depth and consist of approximately 2% of the ocean's water. Part of this zone is also referred to as the photic zone because plants and phytoplankton can grow and photosynthesize here because light can reach them. The transition zone is below the surface zone at which the temperature drops rapidly. This includes the thermocline and also another sp uh, spot called the pycnocline. This is approximately 18% of the ocean's water and the deep zone is where sunlight never reaches. The temperature is extremely cold. It's a few degrees above freezing. At 4 degrees Celsius, which is about its average temperature, water is the most dense that it's ever going to be because once it gets below 4 degrees, it gets lighter, which means it starts to float. At high latitudes, the three layered zones don't exist, though. There's no change in density or temperature, and this causes the deep ocean currents. Approximately 80% of the ocean's water is located in the deep zone. Surface circulation or surface currents is driven by the winds. In detail, ocean currents are always changing. One of the most interesting tracking efforts involved a ship um, that lost a container you know, of athletic shoes. Oceanographers use reports of these shoes washing ashore to refine their models of the ocean currents. Most recently, a cargo of toys was used the same way. Oceanographers were literally tracking ocean currents by following the movements of rubber duckies. Deep circulation is the result of dense, cold, salty water sinking and rising to merge with the surface circulation and then returning to the polars to sink again. So that's different. It's not wind-driven. It is density-driven. There are two main tidal bulges as well. Moon's gravity pulls the oceans. The near side bulge is easy to understand because it's being pulled toward the moon. Um, the moon and the Earth actually orbit around the Earth-Moon center of mass, which is about 1,500 kilometers beneath the surface of the Earth because the Earth is far more massive than the uh, moon. The motion of the Earth around the center of the mass creates a bulge on the far side of the Earth as well. The spring tides happen during the new or full moon, and this causes the sun and moon pulling in parallel directions. The lunar and solar tides will add up, and this creates an unusually large tidal range. In other words, the difference between low tide and high tide is its biggest during the spring tides. The neap tides happen during the quarter moons, and this is the sun and the moon pulling at right angles to one another, and so the lunar and solar tides partially cancel, and this creates an unusually small range of difference between the low tide and high tide. The amplitude of a wave is the vertical displacement of the water from its resting position, more precisely its average position or the main sea, mean sea level. The height of the distance from trough to crest, which is twice the amplitude, is the wave height. The period is the time taken between when any part of a wave passes a fixed point and when the same part of the next wave passes that point. The wavelength is the distance between the same parts of two successive waves. Typically, the crest of the wave is what we measure. Period and wavelength are meaningful only when you have a continuous um, wave motion, not a solitary wave. The frequency is the number of waves that pass as fixed points per second. It is the inverse of the period. In other words, the frequency in hertz, or cycles per second, is 1 divided by the period in seconds. The phase is the relative starting position of one wave compared with another. 
If two waves start at the same position or time, they are in phase. If they start at slightly different positions or times, they are out of phase. Okay, so that's just kind of some basics. I do recommend that you read your textbook on this material because otherwise you'll be really hopelessly confused on all of the terms. So I hope that this will help you get your feet wet and then make sure that you go take a look at the textbook for additional help. Have a great day.